Welcome everyone to a 7 Minutes or Less presentation. Today we will be talking about 24, Season 6. Let's get into this. To those of you who want to know how the season is on the level, it's a step down. I would say the first four hours are extremely good, but once that fourth hour hits, plenty happens that makes the show descend into a graceful decline in storytelling. The plot is kind of a mixed bag of personal malcontent, extreme violence that feels more cruel than usual, and a threat that feels like it's been done before because it has. Only this time it's more than one nuclear bomb which ends early for another plot that feels tacked on. The villain is much like season four's Habib Marwan, where he is brutal enough to be memorable, but doesn't quite reach that height. This season abandons its own events at points where it becomes decreasingly uninterested in what they started as each episode goes along. As for Jack, they set up how crucial it is for him to die to save this country, and the stakes have never been higher, but since being released from prison, he is far more savage, unpredictable, he questions his own abilities, and is perceived a certain way because of it. By the time we get to the finale, the plot has changed. Different characters are at play, and the motives are certainly different, making this one season that you have to see through in order to keep up with. 20 months after the events of Season 5, America is targeted by a series of terror attacks. Abu Fayed negotiates with CTU and the White House that he will release the location of the mastermind of the attacks, Hamri al-Assad, as long as they give up Jack Bauer. President Wayne Palmer authorizes this deal and prepares for this exchange with Curtis and Bill ready to receive Jack at dawn. Only things are not as simple as they seem to be. Abu Fayed has tricked everyone by making al-Assad seem like he's the mastermind when actuality it's Fayette. Jack is told this and finds a way to escape and tells everyone that this is all a setup and they're about to kill the wrong man. When they don't believe him, Jack takes matters into his own hands. Jack combats against CTU to save Al-Assad from being killed and stop Fayette's plan at all costs. Meanwhile, newly elected President Wayne Palmer, Karen Hayes, National Security Advisor along with Tom Lennox, Chief of Staff, all butt heads on what to do, trying to keep intact the right of Muslim Americans. Okay, just by the synopsis alone, there is a lot to unpack here. Things I like, things I didn't, which is more or less a lot of that than what I did like, and there are things that have left me wondering. Were there other ideas to get this plot going? What I did like was how raw and taut the first four episodes were. Everything is questionable. Everyone, and I mean everyone, is on their toes. Worse than season five, with such a hopeless atmosphere, making this the most desperate plot to date. I'd call the first four episodes mostly flawless, giving us storylines that would make anyone go, there's no way they could give us six seasons worth of fine quality entertainment. Well, if you found yourself saying that, congratulations, you just jinxed it. After this point, you will bear witness to the story elements and events kind of decline in execution. It starts with the first successful nuclear detonation since season two and the questionable killing of a beloved character, Curtis Manning. Before I get ahead of myself, I'll say I like, for the most part, how they get Jack back to America so he can get back into action. The real switcheroo of bad guys was my absolute favorite, and wish they kept up that kind of deceiving ploy. Curtis dying and the nuclear detonation in the fourth hour is some of the most poignant moments in television, and Jack pairing up with a former terrorist, Al-Assad, made for an interesting dynamic. That scene, the nuclear detonation, at the time of watching it, shook me to my core. Watching Jack break down after killing Curtis, then watch a mushroom cloud appear, marked a very dark period in the history of 24. Not to mention, a dark period in my life that projected a lot of my own transgressions at the time. Both moments are powerful and heartbreaking, and often referred as the highest death count in 24 has ever put to screen. When the dust settles, it becomes a more divisive story element that I feel could have gone differently. Whatever the story could have been, we could have seen both incidents play out differently in separate episodes instead of seeing one event after another in a desperate attempt to keep Jack in play.
And yet, despite that big shock and awe, I have the biggest problem with Curtis having a sudden vendetta against Al-Assad. Well, I'd say watching 12,000 civilians die is bad enough. Both Curtis being killed and the nuclear detonation happen within minutes of one another. That's just overwhelming. Since introduced in season four, Curtis has always been a true neutral for me. Even when an old flame of his tries to make her way back in the CTU, using Curtis's reputation to her benefit, he's always remained objective. In season five, he continued that loyalty and remained helpful with nothing from his past to haunt him. Then suddenly, vaguely built up, Curtis has a connection with Al-Assad, which felt a bit rushed and out of left field. Al-Assad is a crucial advocate against terrorism, but by the time Al-Assad and the president reach an agreement, Curtis decides it's time to kill Assad for his own personal benefit, forcing Jack to kill Curtis. After the fourth hour, we reach probably some of the most controversial story elements to ever come to the history of 24. I'd love to tell you that they carefully handled the subject material they treaded on, but I can't. Believe it or not, Jack's family comes into play revealing that Graham, mysterious appearance in season five, is Jack's brother. Our new addition into this season is Jack's father, Philip. And they could possibly be behind the attack of today's events. And if I'm being honest, I feel this is grossly mishandled. Once Graham reveals some crucial information about how involved he was from the day's events in season five, and currently, this causes Jack to lose it. We're the same! We are not the same! You want me to kill you? Do it! Drop your weapon! Drop it! And this is just another key piece of evidence that shows that Jack is mentally unstable despite being at the forefront of this investigation. Slightly off topic, but this is a topic that will sort of come up later. But I just need to express the fact that after talking about all these characters, how much of this season feels very empty and hollow. I just feel like season six is extremely divorced from the events of the seasons prior. Despite being directly connected to season five, it's not exactly feeling as if it's in the same vein as the seasons before it. So it makes all the flavor that they thrown in in season five just off. George Mason, Nina Myers, Michelle Dessler, even Tony Almeida, while these characters have passed in their respective seasons, you would watch season two or three, four and even five, and really get a feel like these characters existed. At this point of season six, much of those characters feel long forgotten never to be referenced again. Even worse, Mike Novick from seasons one, two, four, and even five is gone and is never seen again without much of an explanation as to what happened to his character. I know that seasons don't need to do that. The writers don't have to always give reference to that, but it would just be nice once in a while. Moving forward, the nuclear explosion lasts for a good four to five episodes. After that, it's almost an afterthought. This isn't the only time this happens, not with an event, but a character, Philip Bauer. When he reveals himself to be one of the main reasons the day is occurring, creates a hostage situation to exchange Josh for Jack, and when the switch happens, Philip disappears, leaves a phone for Jack to call none other than former President Charles Logan to help him find the remaining nukes. This makes no sense. Just earlier, before the exchange happens, Philip says, even when you were young, I knew to never underestimate you. He knows that Jack's gonna go to incredible lengths to do the right thing and bring everyone to justice, so this whole thing just feels freaking convoluted. What makes less sense is that after Philip disappears for 10 episodes, he reappears for the last four, needing Josh for Philip's supposed legacy. Let's not forget, Philip was adamant earlier in the episodes that he will kill Josh if he didn't get his way. The consistency of his character is just... <clears throat> this is all a bit strange, as we have several main villains that aren't very consistent. Behind Abu Fayed is Dmitry Gradenko, a former Soviet general using Fayed for his ultimate game, with Philip helping Gradenko. Behind Dmitry is a Russian representative, Markov, funding him, authorizing him, and guiding him to execute mass 
casualties using drones to detonate the remaining nukes. There is some tension where Jack has to infiltrate the Russian consulate to get Markov, but could risk himself getting into another bind like he did at the Chinese consulate in season four. Where a lot of this is great makings of tension, the beauty of it is in when it's simple. There are too many villains behind other villains, behind former villains that all have personal stakes. I just feel if they repeated what they did with Habib Marwan in season four and made Abu Fayed the sole villain executing everything with conspirators, he would have taken the cake as 24's most terrifying villains. At this point, you get that the villains aren't very compelling, or the ones that are don't have much to do. So, how's Jack as a character? CTU side of things. The White House and how they're handling this crisis. I have issues with every story element pertaining to all sides. I'll start with CTU. Much of the CTU side of things dive into melodrama while every single person is all hands on deck trying to find the nuclear bombs. While Morris O'Brien gives us some much needed sarcasm and wit, he often clashes with Milo, giving us just enough conflict in this setting. It's all for naught when Morris is tricked into giving a new detonation device for the nuclear bomb. This screeches everything to a halt, where Chloe has to stop what she's doing frequently to make sure Morris is okay. There's a lot of back and forth, Chloe puts her foot in her mouth and depresses Morris even further, and it all comes to a head when Chloe faints. Which all results in the Chloe revealing that she's just pregnant, and Morris finally gets over himself to rekindle things between them. Milo has a thing for Nadia, who is Muslim. Why is her nationality important? It's because this crisis has risen the awareness of Muslim Americans and makes the government distrust them, even though they've been vetted. Yeah, that's great. And after Curtis Manning is killed, Mike Doyle fills in the shoes of Director of Field Operations. And Mike doesn't play around. I'd say Mike adds a much needed element of conflict as the ranks of CTU are highly disregarded and Mike definitely serves as a reminder that the world is not kind to those with sentiments. What I don't like is how Mike's inclusion gives us an unneeded love triangle between Nadia, Mike, and Milo. I mean, uh... Who cares? Doyle never shows back up in future seasons. Why? Oh, because by the end of the season, he's blinded by a bomb. Milo is shot in the head, and Nadia just becomes CTU director after that, after Bill is fired. Oh, I forgot about that. Yeah, we're gonna have to get into that later. We don't get to know what happens to Nadia after that, by the way. Season six is her last appearance. Let's get into the president's side, shall we? Looking past yet another presidential assassination when cabinet members don't get their way, or neglect of truly interesting political commentary by killing off the best character represent that, yes, him, what I really have a problem with is the treatment of characters, especially in this season. Not just because some characters come and go with little to no explanation, I know, I said I'd come back to that, it's what they do with the characters already existing. Let me explain. David Palmer, Sherry Palmer, Keith and Nicole were all in season one. The family is fractured and everyone technically go their separate ways. In season two, David and Sherry are very prominent, where Keith is the only one to show up for one episode. By three, Sherry is called upon David to do some dirty work, leaving these two the only characters to show up with Wayne as a new addition as David's brother as chief of staff since firing Mike Novick in season two. What I'm getting at is that each season comes along showing a natural progression to the family dynamic. In season three, Sherry is killed and David resigns from his campaign. Season four, he is brought back to the last five episodes to help out a matter involving Jack. And by season five, David is literally killed off in the first episode. That's pretty hefty considering the only remaining survivors of the Palmer family are now Wayne, Keith, and Nicole. Keith and Nicole never show back up, nor ever mentioned again. So here in season six, not only Wayne is now president of the United States, we get a sudden new member of the family, Sandra Palmer, sister to David and Wayne, never mentioned before now. Sandra is prominent at first, then literally disappears until something happens to Wayne where they need permission from her to authorize a risky decision. After Wayne's life is attempted on, goes into a coma, and then is revived by Sandra's permission because of the vice president's antics that are getting out of control, Wayne then resumes presidency, only to suffer a stroke on live television letting the vice president resume his acting presidential duties. Little do we know, this is the last Palmer's hurrah. I was hoping that 
that would at least do some redemption scale in the seventh season, but nope, this is it for the Palmers. Hooray! Might as well go into the quality of writing here. Debates on Muslim American rights. How to proceed with such matters. Who is for and against the policies go from engaging to by the numbers conspiracy BS that result in poor choices. Paper thin reasons are acted upon more than making and creating real arguments. What really bothers me is when half the dialogue is acting for the people when they never really focus on anything to do with the people. When people are revealed to be in cahoots with one another, who happens to be involved outside the country, it says only one thing throughout every bit of dialogue. And that is, you're betraying your country. Oh my god, I'm betraying my country. You're betraying your country. You're betraying your country. We're trying to save this country, man. Let's do it. Country. 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 No, we gotta represent them. No, we gotta think like them. We gotta be them. We're... Wait, we were? Huh. I didn't know the suit and the tie kind of put me away from all that. Remember how I said we'd get into Bill Buchanan's firing later? Want to know why Bill was fired? Karen Hayes, now married to Bill Buchanan, but heads with Tom Lennox on the ethical approaches to handle the rights of Muslim Americans. When Tom feels Karen is too much of a problem, he gives Karen this ultimatum that Bill had Abu Fayyad in custody months ago and let him go due to insufficient evidence. Karen resigns as a form of bowing out to save Bill's career, but Karen doesn't show back up until the second act of the season, only for that ultimatum to come back up again to take Bill out of play of CTU. The only good thing Bill's firing is for is to help Jack in the final five episodes or so, but the quality of writing just feels like they were just making things up as they went along. So... How's Jack in all this? Sure, he goes through a heap of problems, makes everyone run for their money, resources, ill will, ethics, and personal vendettas, but how is he handled throughout this season? I can't imagine what the writers were thinking because as soon as they gave us the most intense endings of season five, Jack getting kidnapped by the Chinese, the hard sell would be now, how do we get Jack back to America and have him do his thing? He's given a decent excuse, but I'll admit it doesn't seem strong enough. Jack is literally on survival mode the entire season and is distrusted by everyone. So down the rabbit hole he goes through drama, self-preservation, compartmentalizing, every event he goes through justifying to himself he is getting to the truth, torturing his brother excessively, faces Charles Logan and his newfound willingness to help, and be at the forefront at all the nukes apprehensions. Also, kill Abu Fayed in a badass fight, by the way, only to find out Audrey Reigns is still alive. That's right, everyone. The nuke plotline wraps up and Chang, who was Jack's captor in the Chinese prison, reprises himself not only as a bad guy now, but has Audrey captive. As I thought Cheng was just an operative investigating who was responsible for their Chinese consul's death. I didn't know he was a terrorist, which was just a bait and switch for me, but you know what? Fine, I'll accept that. Jack goes on an entitled spree of you owe me to the president and everybody else, and justifying why he's using government resources to rescue Audrey. At first he is lying to get what he wants, but eventually gets Wayne to sign off on the operation just before Wayne succumbs to his stroke and Noah Daniels, the acting vice president, or shall we say president now, goes back on the order complicating things. The last seven episodes is all about Philip wanting his son, Jack trying to get a piece of his life back by rescuing Audrey and Chang wanting a circuit board from the Russian nuke. Not only that, President Noah Daniels is going through his own melodrama, but it's all just Meh. At this point, there isn't enough situations in the world to make Jack fall to his own humanity. But Jack's humanity and mental capacity is barely tapped into this season. This season almost made him unlikable. It's not until the finale I feel like things gain a better perspective. It doesn't justify his actions, it just explains where he's at mentally after everything that's happened to him. The finale is just Jack telling off Audrey's father, James Heller, about everything that happened in day six. It's not big. It's not twisty. It doesn't bring about the next set of events that set up future seasons. It's just a reflective piece of dialogue between two characters who barely had any screen time together this season, now having its time to shine when the situation is cleared. Nothing compares to Jack's grief and acceptance at the end of this season. So here's what you probably gathered so far in the sixth season of 24. 
Ideas are introduced and abandoned, or they come back to it eventually. The first four hours are downright the most thrilling. Abu Fayed is seemingly the most intense villain yet, but becomes an afterthought. His co-conspirators are just an ends to a means. Everyone suffers either a horrible death to be forgotten later, or they die with a whimper given no irony, cleverness, or any sort of humane reason for their death. I didn't like Jack's family and their story arc. The people behind the people are bland even though they have some creative ways to disperse the bombs instead of just setting in one location and detonating. Overall, this season is the weakest, and it's the one that I have the most problems with. I used to have a massive problem with season 2 and 6 as they came out, Yet, I've come to understand that the one story arc in Season 2 brought down the rest of the storytelling, only until you skip it and the rest of the stories become truly enthralling. So, you may be wondering, did I enjoy anything in this season? I'd say there are some redeeming qualities in this season, but they are few, far, and in between. I really appreciated the finale towards the end. It was just a long wait to get to that point. It's definitely one of my favorite finales to date. I actually like the intensity between how the Russians were going to deliver the bomb using drones. Jack taking matters into his own hands in the Russian consulate was pretty good too. I think the actor who played Wayne Palmer, D.B. Woodside, was amazing, but they played around with his fate too much. And the first four hours are downright the best part of this season. Like I said, Curtis dying and the nuke going off were some of the darkest moments in 24's history. Only when you look back on it retrospectively does it kind of feel a bit much. I can imagine by the point of this show, if you haven't already checked out from the seasons earlier knowing that the main character should have been dead or otherwise, this is the season that tests that the most. It just becomes more and more of a hard sell that Jack Bauer is such a force to be reckoned with, that he is basically a god at this point. Not only that, on the level of compelling drama, it wanes just a bit. It's repeating a lot of the same storylines, and it's just not sure in which direction to go in. This could be enough for anyone to think that the rest of the seasons are just not that good anymore and write it all off. And I'd say that this would be understandable. In the end, the season caught a lot of backlash, and they actually listened, applying what they learned into the next season. But for an audience member that finds the length of a show going beyond a sixth season about one man saving the world, it begs the question, are you up for another season? Or is it just too ridiculous by this point? To those of you hearing the points I've made, what do you think? Do you love this season or found it lackluster? Was it the point where you fell off or just waited until you heard about the next season? Whatever it is, let me know down in the comments. Be kind, be reasonable, and let's talk. Like, comment, and subscribe, and if you're feeling generous, check out the description box. With all that said, thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you all next time.